Well, we're in uh, Mark 12 today. We continue our ser- uh, sermon series through the Gospel of Mark. Um, two weeks ago, we began chapter 12. We're going to pick up in chapter 12 today in verses 13 through 17. Uh, but by way of introduction, I, I just want to tell a story. Um, a man was on vacation, and he was strolling along the beach in front of the resort um, where he was staying, uh, enjoying the sunny weather, when he heard a woman screaming, and he looked over and he saw her sitting down, kneeling down in front of a child. And, and evidently, the, the man came to understand through the commotion that this child had swallowed a coin. And so he ran over And he grabbed the child by the ankles, and he gave him a few shakes, and a quarter fell out of his mouth. And uh, the woman said, oh, thank you, sir. You seem to know exactly how to get that out of him. Are you a doctor? And he said, no, ma'am. I work for the Internal Revenue Service. (laughs) So you see a taxpayer, someone who has what it takes, according to the government. They'll find a way to take it. Seriously, though... Seriously, no one likes paying taxes. Even when you support what they're used for, you find every way possible that you can to pay as few taxes as you can. And in our passage today, Jesus is going to interact with the religious leaders over a question about taxes. Uh, But this, this isn't a question about taxes per se. The issue is where we find um, our hope, where we place our allegiance. And so the question isn't so much about taxes as really the relationship in this case about uh, faith and politics. Now, as soon as I say those two words, you're probably holding on to your seat. You're dreading uh, what may come. Those are two of the most explosive issues, divisive issues that anyone could bring up in our day as well as in Jesus' day. They were probably even more volatile in Jesus' day, given the Roman occupation of Jerusalem at the time. And yet, in what is only 10 words in the original Greek, Jesus provides a perspective that is revolutionary. What Jesus tells us in these verses uh, is the basic orientation for anyone. No matter who you are, No matter what time and place you live in, what your current relationship with God may be, Jesus tells us how we should relate to our society as well as to God himself. This is fundamentally important stuff. And so let's give our attention to God's word. This is Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. Uh, And if you're able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. This is God's Word. Let's pray. Father, speak to us wherever we're at on uh, issues of our day, Father, but more importantly, wherever we're at in our relationship with you. If we're seeking to try to follow you, Lord, speak to us today from this Word. Lord, if we're really stiff-arming you and keeping you at arm's length, Lord, if we're offended by what you say, Lord, speak to us. Lord, help us to see your grace and your love, your purpose, your glory, your authority. Help us to submit to you, to give you our allegiance. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
Well, as we jump into this passage, I want to begin by reflecting first on how Jesus offers a different vision than all of the other groups that were jockeying for power in his day. Jesus offers a different vision. But again, briefly, the context. Since chapter 8, Jesus has repeatedly predicted that when he goes to Jerusalem, the uh, elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law are going to have him put to death but then he'll rise three days later. And then ever since he arrived in Jerusalem, recorded beginning in chapter 11, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, the elders, have challenged his authority. And chapter 12, we looked at two weeks ago, begins with this parable of the wicked tenants. Um, If you missed that, you can can, uh, catch up on that on on our website. But in this parable, Jesus makes it clear that the religious leaders who were opposing him Uh, deserved God's judgment, and it was coming if they didn't turn and repent. All of this culminates in Mark 12, verse 12, which is the verse that is immediately preceding the passage that we read for today. Mark 12, 12 says, Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him, because they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him, and went away. The battle lines have been drawn. The Jewish leaders are looking for a way to discredit and destroy Jesus. And our passage today picks up with their next attempt to do just that. Verse 13, it says, later, um, some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians got together to plan for a way to try to catch Jesus. Uh, to get him in trouble. Now, you need to realize that these two groups, the Pharisees and the Herodians, were enemies. They, They had completely different understandings of what life was about and completely different visions of the future for their country. The Pharisees, uh, we're more familiar with the Pharisees, we read about them a lot in the New Testament, they were loyal to the Jewish people, the traditional Jewish culture, but Israel had been annexed by Rome, conquered and occupied by Rome, and so the, the, the Pharisees were unwilling, servant, unwilling subjects of the Roman Empire. Uh, they were against Roman imperial power. The Herodians, on the other hand, were loyal to a man named Herod the Great, uh, the former king of the Jews, and to his family. Herod was a puppet of the Roman Empire. And so the Herodians only superficially practiced the Jewish religion. They were more committed to Roman and Greek culture. And so the Pharisees were very conservative, but morally and theologically and socially, they were very concerned about keeping the law of God. The Herodians cared little about God's law. They were, by and large, very liberal, morally, theologically, socially. And yet, both of these groups, bitter enemies in every other arena, came together in their mutual desire to get rid of Jesus. The Pharisees wanted to get rid of him because Jesus consistently challenged their understanding of the kingdom of God and the law of God. He undermined their influence, and he was friends with people that they considered to be sinners. And so though he claimed to represent God, he hung out with people that really seemed godless, and he was criticizing them for their righteousness. The Herodians had different worries, totally different concerns. They still remembered a revolt that had happened 25 or 30 years earlier by another man from Galilee, a man named Judas, Judas the Galilean, and he led a violent revolt against the Romans when this very tax that we read about in the passage today was first instituted. The tax was deeply offensive to Jewish people because it was not levied on Roman citizens, but only on the people that Rome had conquered. In other words, this tax was required simply for the honor and joy of being dominated by Rome. But more than that, it was theologically problematic for faithful Jews. 
the hope of God's people from the Old Testament that was, was that one day God would bring forth a king, a Jewish king that would bring about a new kingdom. He would, he would usher in a revolution that would bring a new era of the world under Israel's king reigning over all, a time and a place when everything wrong with the world would be made right. And therefore, the Romans, who were a pagan occupying power, were a direct opposition, a direct challenge to the hope of the coming kingdom of God. They were a challenge to the belief that God himself, God alone, ruled the Jewish people. And so this tax was an affront to everything they held theologically dear. Paying the tax meant that you acknowledged that the land and its people belonged to Caesar and not to God. That was exactly why Judas the Galilean led this result when the tax was first instituted so many years earlier. That uprising was violently crushed by the Romans. They just put it down, and it gave birth to a movement that we call the Zealots. The Zealots were kind of a guerrilla movement against Rome. And so, from the Herodians' perspective, if this new man from Galilee, with his many followers coming into Jerusalem, ended up stirring up trouble, the Herodians could lose power and influence, maybe even their city and the temple. And that was not an empty fear. Less than 40 years later, the Zealots would lead a revolt which ended in the Roman army destroying Jerusalem and the temple. And so both groups have a reason to stop Jesus. Not necessarily a good reason, but they had their reasons. Jesus didn't agree with the Pharisees' understanding of the kingdom of God and the law of God. He opposed their self-righteousness. The Herodians didn't want to see any kind of messianic fervor that would challenge Roman authority. And Jesus opposed their worldliness. And so this strange coalition forms between two groups, the sanctimonious and the sacrilegious. They come together to Jesus with a question to try to trap him. They ask, is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Should we or shouldn't we? Yes or no? Simple question, Jesus. Now, based on what I've explained, do you see the dilemma that Jesus faced? If Jesus says, yes, the tax should be paid, he would be endorsing Roman occupation and Rome's authority over the Jews. The Pharisees could accuse him of heresy, and he would alienate himself from many of the faithful Jewish people. On the other hand, if Jesus were to say, no, the tax should not be paid, he would effectively be labeling himself as a rebel, an insurgent. He would identify himself with his entire line of Jewish revolutionaries against Rome, and the Herodians could charge him with rebellion against Caesar. Either he would be a traitor to his people, indifferent to their plight, their concerns, or he would be a traitor to Rome and a threat to the peace. It's a brilliant trap. No matter what he says about the tax, he's going to get in trouble with someone. But neither one of these agendas fits Jesus' vision for the kingdom of God. He doesn't say yes or no, God or Caesar. His vision of the kingdom of God is much more nuanced and complex than this. And so Jesus, secondly, doesn't fit into anyone's box. Jesus doesn't fit into anyone's box. The Pharisees and the Herodians want a simple answer. They want to know which side of the aisle Jesus is on, right? Which party do you align with? Which camp are you in, Jesus? Each side has their own agenda. Jesus isn't going to change their agenda. If he says something that reinforces their agenda, great. But if he's discredited and hauled off to jail in the process, even better. Most people, most people, I think, um, have a tendency, a temptation, to relate to Jesus in one of two ways. Some of us try to use Jesus to reinforce our agenda, our side, our perspective. Have you noticed that? You know, for example, 
Some conservatives claim that Jesus supports their positions on various issues in our society, oftentimes personal morality. Some liberals claim Jesus to support their positions on issues of social justice and the like. Uh, Both sides probably catch a glimpse of something that's important to Jesus in his own outlook, but their tendency is to only see those things in Jesus that reinforce their views, their own position. And so we take some of the things that Jesus is committed to, if they happen to align with what we're committed to, and then we overlook the rest. And so by doing so, we claim that Jesus is on our side rather than realigning our lives to be on his side but he doesn't fit into our nice little boxes. And so that's why the Pharisees and the Herodians can come together to trap him, even though they were enemies. In many respects, both conservatives and liberals today find Jesus to be deeply, deeply troubling. You see, for the liberal, who doesn't believe, for instance, in a God of wrath, of judgment, a God's right to tell us what is right and wrong, of the reality of sin, Jesus is far too truthful, far too confrontational, far too apparently conservative. And for the conservative who believes, for instance, that they're good because they keep the rules and the real sinners, the real bad people are out there, Jesus seems too lax, too forgiving. He's far too compassionate for broken people who blow it. And even though Jesus may share many of their views, he actually loves and befriends people that they think are the problem. He's far too liberal. For the average liberal, Jesus is a very dangerous conservative, and for the average conservative, Jesus is a very dangerous liberal. Now realize I'm speaking in very binary terms here, and I'm using these terms liberal and conservative to illustrate the issue in our hearts. This applies to virtually everywhere that we think in terms of us and them. The point is, the issue is not whether Jesus is on my side or on your side. The issue is, are we on his side? Others of us don't try to use Jesus to reinforce our side. Rather, some of us just try to trap Jesus. We don't want anything to do with him. Like the Pharisees and the Herodians, whether a person is fundamentally conservative or liberal or or religious or irreligious or, or whatnot, many people wait for Jesus to either agree with them or to give them another reason to despise him. Aha, right? I always knew that Jesus was too left for me, too much compassion, too much grace, too willing to hang around those people who are the problem with our society. Or, aha, I always knew Jesus was too right for me. He talks too much about sin, too much about judgment. He claims to be the only way to God. How intolerant, how narrow. But you can't put him in a box. You can't domesticate Jesus. The burning social and political issues of Jesus' day were important. The pressing issues in our society are also important. I don't want to brush them aside with what I'm saying today, but I want to get at the heart underneath it all. Though Jesus was Jewish and a member of the covenant community of Israel, Jesus was not a nationalist. He's more about Israel. He's He's about more than Israel's standing as a nation. He wasn't about us versus them. He's the head of a kingdom that is ultimately not Jewish or Roman or American or Afghani or any other group. He is the king of a kingdom that takes precedence over all the kingdoms of this world. He wants to invite Jews and Romans and Egyptians and Americans and Mexicans and Syrians and Chinese and people from every other tribe, tongue, and nation into his family. He wants to transform people to be Christians, citizens of the kingdom of God who live as good Jews and good Romans and good Americans and good citizens of whatever society and culture they find themselves in. Dual citizens who represent their heavenly king 
among their earthly tribes. And so look at how he responds to their question. Verse 15, but Jesus knew their hypocrisy. All this flattery was just to butter him up to trap him. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. The question is, should we pay taxes? And Jesus' answer is yes. The use of Caesar's coin acknowledges Caesar's authority, and we are to give to Caesar the things that he's legitimately due. Caesar's image on the coin was there because it was his precious metal. It was used to offer them a currency. It was his wealth and rule that provided the relative safety of roads and and protection and education and more. And therefore, if you use them, give him his due. Christians are to be good citizens. The Pharisees and the Zealots on one hand, thought the Roman Empire was a competitor to God's rule. The Romans thought they ruled because of the strength of their false gods. The New Testament teaches that there are no competitors to God's rule, and God is sovereign over all things. The New Testament teaches in Romans 13, let everyone be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. So whether Israel or Rome, the United States or Afghanistan, the Bible is clear that all nations are subject to the reign and rule of God. He's not threatened by any government. God's kingdom has no competitors. Therefore, verse 7 of Romans 13, give to everyone that you owe them. If you owe them taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. At the same time, while honoring our civic responsibilities, third, Jesus calls for ultimate allegiance to be given to God alone. Our ultimate allegiance is to God. We are to give to God what is God's. Now, this is a profound point. In Jesus' day, the power of the state was absolute. The ruler was thought to be linked to and approved by the empire's gods. And so what the state said was what the gods said. They had ultimate, absolute authority wherever they reigned. And the very inscription on the coin expressed this conviction. The denarius, was the coin that Jesus asked for, was the coin that was required when you paid the imperial tax. And during Jesus' day, the the coin, the denarius, had an image of Tiberius on it. Tiberius was the then reigning Caesar. Here's Here's a picture of one on the screen. On one side, you have Tiberius' face, and it said, Tiberius, king and son of God. And on the other side was another inscription that said, high priest. Tiberius, king, son of God, high priest. Now, you can't miss the irony here. Jesus is the true, eternal Son of God, the image of the invisible God, the true King, the true High Priest. All honor and all recognition, all glory, all dominion should go to Him. But what does Jesus do when they ask Him the question? He doesn't go fishing in His pocket to find a coin. He asks for one. He asked for one, probably because he doesn't have one. When Jesus left his glory in heaven, he became one of us, and he went to the cross. When he did that, he gave up everything. He gave up his life. He gave up his wealth, his riches, his throne. Not one denarius, not one day's wage to his name. He said in Luke 9, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He gave up his home to give you an eternal home. He gave up all of his power and his wealth and his glory in heaven so that you could experience his power and his wealth and his glory as you share in his spiritual inheritance. 
as you were a co-heir with Christ, seated with Him in the heavenly places in Him. Now, this is the amazing thing. The one who is worthy of all honor and glory and dominion set aside that glory and honor and dominion in order to be humbled and rejected, to die a traitor's death on a cross for our sins so that we can be forgiven and reconciled to God. The fundamental problem with this world is not who is in political power. The fundamental problem with this world is sin and the corruption that results from it. And that problem is not remedied by consolidating power for ourselves. That problem is remedied by the one who gave up his power for his enemies, us. I think there's something else going on here. The coin is made in Caesar's image. It has Caesar's image on it. It belongs to Caesar. What is made in God's image? You and me. We are. Yeah. Every person is made in the image of God. He has stamped His image on you. You belong to Him, whether you acknowledge it or not. And so when Jesus says, give back to God the things that are, God, that are God's, He's saying, your whole life belongs to God. Everything about you. He is your creator and your redeemer. That's what Paul was getting at in Romans 12 when he said, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view uh, of this reality that God sent His Son to live the life that you should live and don't and to die a sinner's death that you deserve, but if you have faith in Him, you will never die. You'll never experience. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Consecrate your whole life to God, in other words holy and pleasing to Him. This is your true and proper worship. And so, as a living sacrifice, you are to devote everything about you to God, your body and soul for God's glory as a response to His love that He has showered on you. You're to love Him and love people in His name. So, is there a sin in your life that you are just apathetic towards? You've, you've, strugg- you've given up the struggle what would it mean for you to give, to give your ultimate allegiance to God at that point of your personal experience? Or, or perhaps uh, you're going through life and, and you have your own priorities, your own agenda for life, and you just don't have time for the things of God. Jesus is worthy of your ultimate allegiance. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. It's only when you understand what Jesus has done for you that you're motivated to follow Him. Short of that, God's authority feels like a power play. But in light of His love for us in Christ, submitting to God is a delight. Nothing else satisfies. As Jesus explained earlier in the Gospel of Mark, you realize that to find your life, you give it up for Him and for his gospel's sake, just as he did for you first. This means you take your cues from him. You don't try to use Jesus to justify your agenda. You don't reject Jesus if he doesn't support your agenda. Instead, you come to Jesus and you submit to his agenda. Our ultimate allegiance is to God alone. Nothing is more important than a life lived to glorify God and make him known. Let's pray. Father, it is our our tendency, our temptation all the time, no matter who we are, Lord, to try to get you to support our views, our agenda for our life, for our world. Lord, in many, many cases, it's well-intentioned. We we think we're honoring you, but Lord, sometimes that can get twisted around, and we just want you to bless what we're about rather than really seeking to understand you and your heart and to be about what you're about. But Lord, thank you that you love us. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you that Jesus died a rebel's death for rebels so that we can be your children. Lord, encourage us with this truth. Encourage us that there's nothing we can do 
to separate us from the love of God in Christ if we have faith in you, if we are your children. And so, Lord, help us to do business with you. Help us to grow in our desire for you, Lord, as we experience more of your love for us. We pray in Jesus' name.